Hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, where we'll be taking a closer look at the structure of a POGOL activity. This is the fourth webinar in a series of six being produced by the High School POGOL Initiative and the POGOL Project. My name is Cindy Wengenroth, and I'm the coordinator of the high school programs for the POGOL Project. I will be serving in the role of host for the evening, getting us started with some basic information about POGOL and wrapping things up at the close of our program. Our presenter for the evening will be Christine Sands, and I'm going to ask Christine to introduce herself to you now. Hello and welcome. I teach chemistry in Buffalo, New York, not far from beautiful Niagara Falls, as you can see here. Um, the photo on the other side is from last summer during a trip to the Royal Society of Chemistry in London, England. Much to my fiance's amusement, I thought for a quick photo opportunity with Michael Faraday. His Christmas lectures on a candle served as my inspiration for some initial lab observation activities last fall that I was developing at the time. He laughed at me. Thanks, Christine. Also helping, up this, also helping us this evening by monitoring our chat and organizing questions to be addressed at the end of our presentation is Amanda Zulo. Amanda is a chemistry teacher at Saranac Lake High School in New York. Amanda served as an associate editor in the High School Pogo Initiative Project, and she helped to author, review, revise, and classroom test activities that are included in our collections. So please feel free to use the chat window, which is located to the right of the presentation screen, to enter any questions or comments you might have throughout the webinar for Amanda or Christine. And I think I'll ask Amanda to keep some chat rolling over there by telling us where in the world she was when this icy picture was taken. Uh, while Amanda's queuing up an answer there, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is Pogel. And before I give you a, a whole history or a brief history and overview of Pogel and the Pogel Project, I want to share a little bit of a caution or a disclaimer about tonight's event and really all of the webinars in this series. And that is that these events were not designed to serve as a replacement for the hands-on training that is provided at a Pogel workshop. Instead, our webinars are casual and conversational in nature, giving classroom teachers who are currently implementing Pogel an opportunity to share their personal experiences and anecdotes, which hopefully will help you see how Pogel theory translates into actual classroom practice, and will give you some points to think about when you're considering how Pogel activities can fit into your specific classroom and curriculum. If something sparks your interest tonight, I really want to encourage you to attend an event if you're at all able. Information about upcoming workshops is available on our website. I know we have several workshops that are taking place this summer in conjunction with larger conferences, uh, such as the 2YC3s, the ACS meeting, and BCCE and State College this summer. Uh, we also have our summer multi-day regional meetings that will be taking place. So check pogol.org if you're interested in registering. With that caution said, pogol stands for Process-Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. It began in the mid-1990s when a group of undergraduate chemistry professors really became dissatisfied with the traditional format of their lecture classrooms and started looking for alternatives and different ways to teach. Uh, they started investigating research on how people learn and found three ideas that kept coming up over and over again that resonated with them. The first was teaching by telling does not work for most students. In other words, their lecture format really was not the best way to cover information. The second was that students who are part of an interactive community are more likely to be successful. And the third was knowledge is personal. Students enjoy themselves more and develop greater ownership over material when they're given an opportunity to construct their own understanding. What they really were hitting upon was the idea of combining constructivist learning theories with cooperative learning techniques. And so they worked to create specially designed activities for students to complete in groups. These activities follow the learning cycle, which Christine is going to go into more detail about tonight. And they focus on core concepts to encourage deep understanding of course curriculum. 
And so the process-oriented piece, that's the PO, the cooperative group work, and the GI guided inquiry part follows the learning cycle, and that's where the acronym comes from. You'll see the activities all begin with data or a model. They're followed by a series of leading questions that are scaffolded to guide students to a desired conclusion. And the activities end with questions that give students an opportunity to do something with the knowledge that they have just uh, created or the concept that they've developed. They met with great success in using these activities in their classes. And in 2003, received a grant from the Ni National Science Foundation to begin sharing this methodology with others. And that was kind of the birth of the Pogel Project. They held workshops and gave presentations at larger conferences and events. And eventually, high school teachers and teachers from other content areas uh, started asking for materials, uh, particularly to bring this to the secondary level which led the project to seek out funding to create the HSPI, the High School Pogel Initiative. And in 2008, they received funding from the Toyota USA Foundation to create this initiative uh, with three main goals, to develop uh, collections of activities for high school use, to train high school teachers both in using Pogel in their classroom and also on how to share the methodology with others, and to develop a network of implementers. And those are the folks who are volunteering their time to put on these webinar series for you. Um, I think that really says something about the quality of the people who've been involved with the HSPI, that they are willing to commit to volunteer to promote this uh, methodology that they've used and that they experienced such success with it with their students. And I'm pleased to say that we are wrapping up after three years that High School Pogel Initiative with the publication of the materials that we're going to take a closer look at tonight. We currently have two collections available, one for first year biology and one for first year chemistry. We have AP collections that will be coming. The AP biology collection is in the final editing stages with the publisher. It will probably be out in mid-May. And we have an AP Chemistry collection that will be available through Flynn Scientific uh, in January of 2013. And at this point, I am going to pass the torch to Christine and ask her to get started with sharing our goals for the content portion of our evening. Thank you, Cindy. This evening, everyone will become familiar with the format of activities from the High School Pogel Initiative Collection though the core ideas are similar for other POGOL activities. In addition, hopefully you will gain an appreciation for how activities are structured and the thought process that goes into the questions in their order. I hope you will feel comfortable asking questions as well as giving opinions and perspectives in the chat window where you've seen Amanda already. So tonight I'll be talking about the learning cycle. We'll look at sections of actual HISPE activities um, you were sent the link for those, but I'll be uh, having them also on the slides. And we'll, at the end, spend a little bit of time talking about the PO, the process-oriented part in our classrooms. All right, so as a teacher, one of the things I love best about Pogo activities is how they follow the learning cycle. Students develop their own definitions for terms that they otherwise would memorize and not really understand. And it was one of the first times I found a class activity that involved students using both inductive and deductive thinking in close proximity. Inquiry activities I had previously seen involved students exploring an area, but never really coming to a conclusion about what it meant or how it could be used. So in a learning cycle, the students will be exploring an idea and then the concept invention part, or they'll be developing their own definitions or ideas about what that means, and they will also be applying it all in one activity. So a Pogel activity begins with giving the students a context for the, acti for the information of the activity, and that takes place in the Y box. Students don't really care about how electrons are moving in atoms, but they think fireworks are cool, and hopefully something in the Y section will hook them into the activity. Sometimes it contains an analogy, like the one in the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell activity. As a scientist, one of the things that I love best about Pogel activities is the interaction students get with data. 
So before we move on, I have a couple of questions I'd like to poll the attendees. On the window that will pop up, please click on a response to the question, how often do you ask your students to interpret data? Sometimes these polls take a couple of minutes. Um, in the chat tab, please, when you're finished with that, type a response to an additional question. What are some factors that limit your ability to have students interpret data? So it looks like everyone um, almost everyone has students interpret data every week or so. And I'm glad we're, we're doing it at least that often because hopefully we're doing a lab almost every week. But I find that the poll activities do help give an additional opportunity for students to interpret data in addition to the laboratory. I see Jennifer mentioned that time is a problem. I think that's always a, a problem in our classrooms for doing everything that we want to do. Um, I've also found that a lot of the standardized testing that's required um, requires a lot more deductive reasoning and not quite as much inductive reasoning, though um, there is a trend for some of that changing as well. Lee is saying something also along those lines. The state assessments have to focus part of what we do. Well, I think the POGOL activities do provide some guidance to students drawing their attention to important or poignant information. And that gets us off to the next slide. Models can take many forms, including diagrams, graphs, or tables. They often represent particulate for chemistry or microscopic for biology levels and encourage students to make the relationships between symbolic gobbledygook letters and equations to things that they can actually observe. Let's take a look at a few examples from Pogel activities. In the electron energy and light activity, students compare and contrast different spectra and get an idea of how the spectra are made. So a classroom where a high power voltage source and discharge tubes might not be used, students can see what happens. But this isn't a replacement for the lab because even if students do get to see it live in the classroom with spectroscopes, now they can have a better picture in their head of where what they're seeing comes from because I don't think they ever realize that there are prisms inside those little black boxes of the spectroscopes. I have another question for you now. Do you wish that your students were better observers? What are some ways that you encourage this? I find that sometimes my students have trouble figuring out where to focus their attention or they can't find appropriate words to describe what it is that they see. Occasionally, both of those, um, occasionally I find that they don't really appreciate it, even if we could teach them to be uh, better observers, but uh, most students, I think, gain a lot from practice along those lines. So exploration questions help focus students in their observations of what's in the models in a poll activity. These exploration questions are directed questions that um, help the students 
focus on the specific parts that are important if they can't figure that out immediately. Types of questions um, that are seen in actual activities are things like what type of bacteria is found on this plate and what is the charge of a sulfite sulfate anion. So um, it will then prepare the students to answer subsequent questions. So to summarize the exploration stage of a pogo activity, there are many directed questions, ones with set answers that students can discern from the models. Students are often led to compare and contrast on a model, like here in the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell activity. It may be the organelles in a cell or the number of dissolved particles in a saturated versus unsaturated solution. But either way, the students are practicing their observational skills in a place that isn't the lab. I think this prepares them even better for going into the lab. These exploration questions guide students to look at the right things before they're moving on to higher level questions. You'll find examples of exploration questions in the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell activity in numbers um, 1 through 6a, if you did go take a look at those. Models can even be interactive, like this one with the Bohr model, and students need to refer back to previous information to discern a context for subsequent models. In this case, the students see which energy levels the electron is moving between, and then they match that to a color on the hydrogen spectrum from the previous model that we saw with the prism in it. Read this box is also part of most HISPE activities. Despite all the benefits of models, we know that sometimes words are the best or at least the most efficient way to present information. A read this section is designed to present additional information necessary in an economic fashion. It introduces terms or summarizes information as part of the concept development phase of an activity. In this example from Electron Energy and Light, the ideas of excited and ground state are introduced to explain a bit more about the spectra. And this is linked very closely to the Bohr models that we saw in the last slide. So here's another poll. How often do you find your students memorizing textbook definitions? I find my students are somewhere in between. They're split between, um, even if they're not completely correct, they will memorize the um, definition from the textbook. And that's uh, even after we've talked about some subtleties about how real life is a little bit different from that definition. Or um, they will put the definitions in their own words when I force them to in a class assignment, homework assignment. So one of the things the Pogel activity does in the second stage of the concept invention stage is it does help them understand definitions without the traditional textbook memorization that it seems like many of us are finding. Concept invention questions lead students to compare and contrast so they can differentiate between ideas. Some examples can be found in the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell activity, numbers 19 through 21. Um, we also see a few more examples here where we can compare and contrast. For example, which molecule in the list would you predict to have the highest boiling point? So this would be after they would um, go through a model where they're looking at some structures or something else about the molecule. Um, based on the examples given, propose a definition for the term sunk cost. Or what is the evidence that you have to support your conclusion? This is a big thing 
in my class anyway, because whenever a student makes a claim, the, they know the question right behind it is going to be why. And I think the Pogol activities help prepare them as they work together to answer these types of questions. Okay, a couple more questions to keep us going in the, in the chat window. What role does critical thinking play in your classes? And how much time are you able to allot to going deep in a concept? I know for me, I have to strike a bit of a balance with the critical thinking in my classroom because I like to push the students, but I know that we need to have a balance. Jennifer says, I would like to think critical thinking plays a huge role, but usually don't have the time to go that deep. Uh, I agree that the, the time is a big thing, um, especially like Lee said, for um, cases where you have state tests or standardized tests that you're working toward. I think that the Pogel activities help bring it in in at least a small way on the days that we're not making it our main focus. So with all the information students need to understand, as we said, we don't have time to go that deep. But to ask students to come up with an analogy for whatever it is that they've just learned or to make predictions. Um, I love asking them what if or asking them to say propose a situation where something is going to be similar to what they've just looked at. Um, how, how might scientists experimentally, experimentally determine the mass of a proton once they've gone through um, an activity that's talked about issues surrounding that, I think that it helps them take that next step. Now, as you may know, Pogel activities are intended to be used for group work. Beyond the inquiry ideas and written questions, there is a lot of interaction within the classroom written into the activities. Inherent in the activity are the parts that necessitate interpersonal interactions. Sometimes it is overt where students individually brainstorm and then come together to write complete descriptions. Stop signs and keys help to facilitate some of this interaction. Stop signs are checkpoints where the spokesperson of a group calls me over to check the recorder's written answers for correctness and completeness. I often ask the group an additional question to get them to better focus their answers, to better phrase them. Stop signs provide an opportunity for me to check to be sure that the students are on track during an activity. Sometimes one group is a little bit frustrated by the activity or each other and they sidetrack me, but the stop signs is, is one way I'm sure to spend time with all the groups and check for understanding throughout the class. Keys identify important or key ideas before students start the application questions. Also, the keys provide natural talking points for whole class discussions or sharing because you'll emphasize the pointy ideas. They're also directly linked to the learning objectives. Learning objectives can be found in the teacher resources section of a Pogel activity. Um, you can't find the teacher resource sections on the um, activities you could download from the Pogo website, but they can be found at Flynn, on the Flynn.com website for the activities that have been made public or in the collections themselves available from Flynn. As an intellectual, I ate up the guided inquiry side of Pogo, as you've probably heard me talk about right from the start. Thus, as a teacher, I had to work to appreciate and fully utilize the process-oriented aspects in my classes. The ways that the groups are formed and the way it, it seemed the students always have been better at getting each other to work in the group with good written direction as 
you can find in most POGOL activities than I have been able to facilitate on my own. Um, ways that the process skills are encouraged in a group work is encouraged and, um, are things like brainstorming, as I mentioned earlier. Each member must contribute one complete sentence to a final answer. Often, when they're just writing one sentence, I find that students um, will nitpick each other over which words to choose or the order of the words to choose as they're putting it in there it becomes a really good conversation. Um, record a consensus of and finding that consensus sometimes the students ask me to come in as a tiebreaker which most of the time I refuse to do but help facilitate them coming up with their final answer. Um, so this makes it pretty different from some of the other worksheets that you might find where the students really shouldn't divide and conquer to accomplish the goal. Now Mike, Mike says he uses stop signs for reporting out and making sure the class has the ideas that I want. I agree that that's a, a great point to stop. I find that in my class, um, I always have groups that are far ahead while others are far behind. So um, it's the, the stop sign questions or the key questions will be the ones that I pick to report out um, stopping the groups in the middle wherever they happen to be. So to summarize, POGOL activities model scientific reasoning for students. They practice both inductive and deductive reasoning while the students are completing the activity. I find that this parallels the scientific method pretty closely, which is great to have in our science classrooms. They provide a context for the introduction of new terms and makes it easier to scaffold um, and continue that constructivist learning as you proceed forward through an activity or through a unit, even if you're only doing one POGO activity, which is um, what I often do in a unit. And it express, explicitly provides opportunities for critical thinking. And some of that critical thinking is in small ways. And um, I can push them in bigger ways in other classes and other contexts. But this helps them take that next step in a series of questions. So that concludes the formal part of this presentation. I'd be happy to answer some questions. Um, I've been trying to monitor the chat a bit as I've been going along, but of course I'm not paying as much attention to that as Manda is. I hope that you feel your questions have been answered. Thank you so much, Christine, for your presentation. And we'll give people a minute or so here if they have some questions they want to ask or um, something they would like some follow-up on. I know I saw some questions about what you do at the stop signs. Um, I saw some questions about what the keys are for. So we'll give it a minute to see if anybody has other questions they'd like to bring up. Yeah, so actually in the activity next to the question numbers, you'll find pictures of keys and pictures of stop signs. And I find, uh, I tell the students that the keys are often the parts that they wanna go back to when they're going to study for their test, just like they would from other notes and homework. And um, like Mike mentioned, the stop sign is often a good place to uh, have, have reporting out as a whole class or send a student from one group to check with another group so they can share some answers. We asked, what are some good ideas for a post-Pogel follow-up in class? I'd love to hear what some other people have to say. Amanda answered that. I, I think that the post-Pogel follow-up is, um, for me, I'd say about half the time is the next day we do a lab that's related to it. And the other half the time, the next day we're um, diving into uh, notes um, in a little bit more traditional way. I think that's pretty typical that people use a POGOL activity as an introduction to a unit. Yeah. 
Melissa has a good idea where she has her students do a summary of the activity in their notebooks. I've had students do that in a, um, a, in a homework assignment as well, where the follow-up is we talk the next day about everyone's top three things or top five things, whatever number it is that I choose, that, um, that they, of ideas that they thought were important from the activity. So that's my take on a similar thing that Melissa does. Would I change any of my methods for using Kogel in a setting with older adults? Well, I know that we've used Pogel activities to introduce the ideas of Pogel in workshops with adults, and that has worked really well. So I don't think there is much that I would change for different age groups. Um, I would love to hear from anybody else what they think. The Jennifer asked about the extension questions at the end of the activity. Um, are those used to assess understanding? Some teachers use them as extra if there is time. I'd say about half the time for me, I use them as uh, extra if there is time. And usually it's for the groups that, um, that are moving a little bit faster. I tell them it's extra thinking practice. Um, I find that the extension questions are on the same topic, but different. So I, I don't think that they're good to use to assess understanding. I think the better ways um, to assess, there, there are always some assessment questions in the teacher guides that go along with the HISBE activities. And those would be, I think, helpful for assessment. Right, that's exactly it, Christine. The activities were designed so the assessment questions that are included in the teacher materials are there for you to use as assessment, and the extension questions are just that. People use them um, for those groups that are working ahead or, again, to just take, have another couple questions, another little take on an activity topic. Yeah, sometimes it is on something a little bit different. Um, looking at a a strong acid, strong base activity the other day, and the extension questions were about KA. And I wouldn't, I don't even want my regular chemistry students to do those. However, I, uh, when I get to it with my honors chemistry class, I'm doing things a little bit different order. Uh, they'll be required to do those because it is getting a little bit into the equilibrium part. So that's one example. I like Mike's idea here about using an extension question to start off a class the next day to get back into conversation about the topic. Any other comments or questions from the group? Well, if you think of any while I'm talking, continue to feel free to post them in the chat and we'll work to address those, but we'll keep moving on. Um, thanks again, Christine, for your time and efforts in presenting for us tonight. We appreciate it. So just to wrap up, I want to share with you some of the resources that are available for you to continue uh, learning some more about Pogel and exploring how Pogel may fit in your classroom. On our Pogel website, under the Resources tab, you will find curriculum materials, uh, which has links to all the publishers, all the ac different activities that are available, uh, including the link to Flynn Scientific for the HISPE materials that we've taken a closer look at tonight. You'll also find our implementation materials, uh, including the HISPE implementation guide, which I would really uh, encourage you to take a few minutes to, to click through. There are some great videos, uh, forms, uh, rubrics, a lot of material that our high school people have developed over the past three years, all collected there in a format that hopefully you'll find easy to use uh, and that will help you uh, see some ways that POCO can be used in your classroom. Uh, the videos in particular, I think, are really great for helping you to, to get a peek at what a POCO classroom can look like. 
there's a downloadable instructor's guide there uh, that you can print out if you're interested in that. And there are also a whole lot of um, teaching videos. We call them interpersonal effectiveness videos to help uh, you train your kids in how to work effectively in a group. So if you're being a good leader, what does it look like? What does it look like if you're being a good listener? How do you use active listening or how do you reflect a person's question back to them? What does it look like when you're not being a good group member? Th these are really great short clips that you can show at kind of the start of a class to help kids get thinking about what it looks like to be a good group member and how to work effectively in a POGO group. There's also some selected references and some other links that we think you might find helpful as you're looking to implement POGO. So go to the POGO website under that resources tab. Those implementation materials are really helpful. Uh, this is the series of the six webinars that we're doing. You can see the ones that have the star beside them. There is a recording available on our website for those if you want to go back and listen. They all take about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, and they're available under the high school tab of the website. Um, tonight, we looked at the POGO activity up close. Coming up next month, we're going to talk about group dynamics, uh, some of the questions that people have had about how you place students in groups, how do you work with different kinds of groups, what do you do with a dysfunctional group, just all that, all that stuff about how to make a POGO group work effectively. And our last webinar in this series is going to be about reporting out and helping students make connections as they move after class and beyond uh, after having done a POGO activity. So thank you so much for joining us for this evening. Again, please visit the website to sign up for a live event. I'd encourage you to do that if you can or to listen back to some of our other webinars uh, if you want to catch up on those other topics. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email me at cindy.wpogel.org. Thank you.